I didn't even think it was in the cards and I honestly uh, didn't even cross my mind until I started raising my hand and bidding for the trip. Mine was a pre-planned all-girls trip. Four and a half miles, four shells, that's how long it took and that's like this tracker. If we didn't have that guy, we would have never found this out. We saw a herd of them. Um, and he had asked because Debbie kind of disabled too. Yeah. And then I didn't move up the time. He took his time. <laughs> yeah. We stuck up a little bit closer and closer. And then I realized how massive this thing was. Tejas. Tejas. The podcast is the podcast for you and you and you and you. What's up, guys? Welcome to episode 17 of the Teos Hunt Club podcast. I'm Brandon McDowell, and today I'm going to be sitting down with Megan and Jared, and we're going to be talking about Africa. So both of them went to Africa in 2019, um, almost kind of close to each other. Megan went in June, Jared wound up going in July, but they kind of had two different trips and two different versions of what Africa could be. So, I mean, there's multiple, multiple things that you could do in Africa, um, and each of them you can kind of cater to what you want to do. But So if you've never been to Africa, if you've thought about going to Africa and just don't uh, know how to maybe pull that trigger or kind of want to get some insight on it, this is going to be a great podcast for you to listen to. Um, we go over their whole trip pretty much, um, what they hunted, where they went, um, and even some of the things they saw while traveling. So uh, I hope you like this podcast. I really enjoyed sitting down with them and talking about it because I haven't been to Africa and it's very, very high on my list. Uh, mostly for Cape Buffalo and, you know, some of the more dangerous stuff, but the Plains game still excites me too. So, like I said, this podcast is pretty cool going over Africa and hunting over there with them. Um, so, thanks again for listening. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the YouTube channel, follow us on Instagram, leave a review on the uh, podcast uh, wherever you're listening, Apple Apple Podcasts or even Spotify. So uh, appreciate y'all listening and uh, hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome to episode 17 of the Teos Hunt Club podcast. I'm Brandon McDowell and this week we're going to sit down and talk about Africa. Um, so I haven't had the opportunity to go yet, but it's pretty high on my list. But Megan's been and our buddy Jared's been also. So uh, this podcast is we're going to kind of tell their story, um, how they got to go to Africa, how their trip went, all that kind of stuff. So uh First off, I want to tell Jared, you know, we got some, went down to the Bailey Hill. It's the code name for where we went today. Oh, Bailey Hill? Yeah. Okay. I saw I saw Bailey. some uh, some good fawn crop in the video. Where yeah, you? dude, we saw a little fawn run across the road, filled some feeders, and uh, did were a little twins. mowing. It was twins. Oh, yeah. Well, two of them. One of them didn't cross the road, and hopefully it'll find mom again, but uh, it was pretty cool seeing them out there, though. So we were just going to water, but we did a little bit more than water. It was dang hot. Yes, it was. <laughs> what are you dinging over there, man? Oh, that's no. <laughs> Gotcha. So I want to know y'all's take on Africa before you went. Like, what was it high on y'all's list to go? Was it like not at even all. in the cards? No. <laughs> Not at all. And Jared probably has a totally different answer. I, I didn't even think it was in the cards. And I honestly, uh, didn't even cross my mind until I started raising my hand and bidding for the trip. So I thought it was <laughs> oh, yeah. way too how we... fetched for me. Yeah. So Jared, how did you get to go on? How, how did you get your trip that you went on? So me and a neighbor of mine, uh, went to the local CCA banquet here and, um, uh, saw the live auction items and you know I, th I was ready to to kind of try to get a hunt let's go do something else except for whitetail and everything we have here and so yeah. flipping through the book they had a red stag hunt down in uh, new zealand and i was like wow that's cool let, let's see if we can do it so we get to the red stag hunt that was farther down the list and as soon as they start bidding on this thing it shoots up as <laughs> anywhere close that I was going to even start bidding for it. So, so yeah. well, you know, X that out. Well, let's just chill. I won't spend any money. Jenna won't be mad at me and it will be good. So <laughs> uh, the last 
hunt and thing on the auction item list was a two person, uh, four animal trip to Africa. There was no airfare, just the animals were included. Um, and so we we're sitting there and nobody was bidding on it and it was hanging out at like $700. And this is granted a two man trip, each get four animals. And I look at Kevin and I'm like, dude, I, I don't know what this is about, but I can't let this go like that. And so we start raising our hand and we get to, I think it was $1,700. We went to bid um, and they had an extra one. And so both parties that were bidding on it got the same thing for $1,700. And so if you think about it, you split $1,700, you both get four animals and then you pay for airfare and taxidermy. So yeah. I, I went to Africa for around $5,000 my first trip. So. Yeah, which a lot of people don't. Like I, I tell everybody, man, if you want to go to Africa, if you want to go travel and hunt, go to an auction. CCA, yep. Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, Texas Trophy Hunters, Dow Safari Club, all of them. I mean, all these auctions, I mean, granted, there's a lot of people in these rooms, but uh, most of these people in these rooms for like the smaller hunts, especially planes game and stuff, they, they've already been. They've done it three or four times. So there's a lot of opportunity to get in there and get cool hunts like that for, for relatively pretty cheap. And they go to a good cause usually. Yeah, yeah. And the money's going to a good cause to support those organizations and stuff. Yeah. So Megan's trip, Totally different. Totally different. Completely different. <laughs> um, and yours, we went like a month apart, right? Didn't you go right after me, right before me? Yeah, you, you went before me. I went the next month. I went in July. I think you went. Yeah, June of 2019, and you went in July. Yeah, so we're, like, coming up kind of on, like, the little anniversary right of before, it right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, mine was a pre-planned all-girls trip. That's why Brandon couldn't get still. Had to stay here and feed the dog. <laughs> yeah, so we, uh, my friend Monica, she had been multiple times, and so she had all the resources and all the best places to stay and the best pHs and everything else, and she made a very convincing argument um, and it was nice because the way that they had the group put together, it was discounted heavily because there was such a big group that was coming. Um, so same thing, like mine was a super affordable trip. And I think we went right before everything just turned upside down for the entire industry over there. But I mean, we went and the, I had one animal on my list. So we'll, we'll get into that in a minute. But I, I, def I didn't have like, I had to shop. Like I didn't know I wanted this specific animal. I didn't know what country I wanted to hunt in. I didn't know, you know, which pH I was going to use, or I hadn't thought about it really yeah. until I was part of the ranching wildlife commu um, committee in Houston and met Monica and yeah. we had mutual friends. And so, yeah, she was like, we're doing an all girls trip. And she'd done it multiple times. Yeah. Same thing, all girls trip, <laughs> which was great. But yeah, I mean, it was completely different. I had never thought about wanting to go. I honestly had killed white tailed deer and a black buck before that so i i wasn't super experienced over here <laughs> <laughs> not to brag or anything it's just kind of how it happened for me yeah, yeah. so I, I know megan has you know traveled before so that wasn't like a long plane fight plane flight oh, for no. her but jared i'm was that the longest plane flight you've been on before yes and it is still the longest plane flight i've been <laughs> on i've been to you know costa rica mexico on vacation you know it's still a three or four hour flight for that in vegas the same thing but uh, a 13 hour flight from houston to atlanta to atlanta to johannesburg yeah I, I, I it was fine and i was there and i knew i was going and i was excited about it but 13 hours trying to sleep sitting up in a chair with all these people mm -hmm. see it. not really my ideal accommodations for sure and yeah, our trip yeah. was even longer because we went to London first. Yeah, that's right. That's, so I would definitely probably would have bowed out even if the <laughs> plus, was there. And plus, the biggest yeah. part, you, you walk on the plane and you're going to like the economy seats in the back. And yeah, you you're seat like the sardines. Seats in the front and people are lounging, laying down with champagne glasses and <laughs> trays. And you're like, well, that's not me. So, yeah, yeah. If I, when I go, I don't think I'm going to have to splurge on, on trying to you know, get a first class seat. Cause, I yeah. mean, you wrote economy to Las these, Vegas. These <laughs> shoulders, man, don't really fit in plain seat. You don't even fit in the screen right now. So yeah, yeah I'm gonna have to splurge on that a little bit. But I know, uh, Megan, y'all used the uh, rifles and stuff there. Yes. But Jared, you took yours with you, right? Yep. So kind of like, what was that process like, like taking your rifle to another country? <laughs> 
it was interesting. It wasn't as bad as I thought it would be, too. So I, I didn't have a big enough gun. That, you know, 270 is what I hunt with here just growing up and everything with my tail. But it's like I need something with some more punch. And so I, I bought a Bergara 300, 300 wind mag when I knew we were going. Sighted it in, brand new. You know, got it, got it dialed in pretty good. Um, and it wasn't that bad. The, the biggest thing here was you had to go, I had to go down to Houston to get like all the customs paperwork stuff done mm -hmm. and signed off on. And to, you have to put that information in the gun case, lock it, you know, when you go to the airport, which I will say the first, that's the first time I took a gun in the airport too. And it was weird. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's just trippy. Even just the fact of firearm in general. I mean, yeah. so the, the American side was easy, right? You go in and they didn't even, you know, bat an eye. They're like, okay, cool. You got a rifle. Let me have it. When you get to Africa, that was the shit show. Like it took so long and it was like these people did not even know what they were looking for in this paperwork and our guy yeah. like the the people from the safari like came and picked us up and they were having to kind of talk to these guys and work it through there because we were they were lost for about two hours trying to get all our rifles and stuff through there. So that makes me wonder how many people actually do bring them on. I mean I, I know like quite a few people have. I mean it's Man, it's just it's trust in airlines with your stuff. Yeah. We don't even check our camera gear. Yeah, we hardly. Yeah, like we, we don't. don't. Well, I haven't. Like we haven't traveled that much, but I I wouldn't do it just mm -hmm. because like I'd rather have it on me and make make sure that it's gonna get to where I'm going. But I mean, a lot of people travel with their rifles and stuff. But it's like I said, just trust in the airlines and like you see how they throw bags and stuff on mm -hmm. there. Just, I, that's when you je definitely can justify like spending the extra money on that four hundred and five hundred dollar gun case or phone yes. case, yep. <laughs> just to make your give your little your mind uh, a little ease on it. But yeah, that's it's just crazy. But so like y'all traveled to London first, you said. Mm -hmm. So y'all were just decided to go that way or it, well, i think it was more affordable and the ladies kind of all agreed that like some of them had never been to london yeah and i like london i've been once before it was in 2010 but i mean it's it was a beautiful city and it was halfway decent food it's english food but yeah. it's okay so we had fish and chips you know and we were at the castle and did a tour and all that good stuff we stayed there for a day um the power actually went out at the airport while we were trying to get back to the airport for our flight so, so the, the, the entire <laughs> So we got. I, I like flying. I don't like airports. We got, I don't yeah. like airports. We got a, a notification from what I remember coming back. We were in our, in our in, you know, the cab coming back. And I think it was just like entire terminal power outage, you know, 10 days. Like, we'll let you know when things are back to normal, blah, blah, blah. And it, it was just, you know. And we had gotten a little hotel room. You can, like, rent these little hourly rate hotels. That sounds horrible. But you can... <laughs> but you can that's the one you wanted to stay in. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can, okay? And um, we, we wanted to go take showers and get ref refreshed and everything else. So stayed in London, finally left London, um, flew from there to Cape Town, and then from Cape Town to Port Elizabeth is the last airport that we stopped at. Got gotcha. you. Did you run any, any trouble in Atlanta's airport? I've heard that airport's pretty big. No, not any trouble because I was literally sprinting to the next gate. We there was a delay going from Houston to Atlanta, and they were like, "Oh, y'all are gonna have to run." And so me and Kevin got off, and literally like either power walking or we had a light jog going on through this airport, and literally made it to the door before they were about to close the thing and, and go. So I didn't get to see Atlanta very. You know, <laughs> that's about it. Uh, yeah, but a lot of no issues there. Yeah. So uh, what were the four animals were that for you, Jared, like the four animals, were they already picked or you, you have a, like a choice that you could go through? No. So they already kind of picked them out. It was kind of like a not management, but, you know, they were trying to manage their herd and like they had certain species, abundance of certain species that they were, you know, donating to CCA and doing that kind of stuff. Yeah. So they had a, a warthog, a blue wildebeest, an impala and a blessed buck. And then oh, yeah. we added both Kevin and I added on a kudu. And then I tried to, I didn't really like the way a blessed book looked. So I, I tried to change it out for something else. They said no at the time, but come to find out they didn't have a mature blessed book where we were hunting. And so they let me yeah. change it out for a spring book to, to want right there. 
Yeah. Okay, so landing in Africa. This isn't for the first time being on, you know, the dark continent or landing there. Like, could you tell that you're in a different place, like, at first? Or was it, like, kind of something similar, I guess, walking through the airport? The minute you step off yeah. the airport. Where was the last airport you flew into? We flew into Johannesburg and then drove okay. three hours south to Limpopo. Okay, yeah. That was like we were either going to fly into Johannesburg or Cape Town then Port Elizabeth, and so we did the, the latter. And yeah, I mean, as soon as you get to Cape Town, it's very obvious. It's beautiful. The coast is so pretty. Yeah, yeah. That's what I'm hearing. I mean, I've seen pictures and stuff, but it's it's. I guess it is you have to be there, you know, I guess, to feel it, but like, I'm, I'm sure it is pretty different than, you know, being here at home. I saw people. I didn't see the landscape. It was dark when I got there, and then we got in a car and drove three hours south. And so I didn't see it till the next morning when we woke up. Yeah. Oh, man. The first thing we saw were orange groves. It was so cool. Yeah. There was so much agriculture, and I could go off on a whole tangent about that. But yeah, there was a huge orange grove right next to the place we were staying. And we drove from Port Elizabeth Airport to Addo, A D D O, I believe was the name of the first town. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. It was beautiful when I first got there. Yeah. Was right there on the coast. Nice, nice. So I guess you said you didn't really see anything till the first day. So what what did y'all do the first day? Um, did y'all hunt immediately, or did y'all ride around, check out the property? How'd that go? So the next morning we woke up. We we were kind of standing there like a a commune, I guess, like they had just a big old hunt camp that, you know, they had a lot of other clients there too. Not a lot, I mean, but two or three other groups that came in and, uh, they had like a, just a kitchen breakfast area where we eat meals. So you'd wake up and they'd have coffee and serve you meals and do all that kind of stuff. And then we kind of we went out and checked the rifles, sat of those in if we needed to, everything was still on. So I guess they didn't make it around too much, but um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, did that. And then that at you know we kind of hung around and it was it wouldn't have been morning but we did go out and start driving around and, and kind of scouting and looking for stuff at that point yeah y'all had megan you had like extra stuff oh, added man. on to y'all's ours to y'all's so trip cool. so i like, kind of explain how that went so ours was like half of the women didn't hunt at all uh, well they had in the past but they weren't planning on hunting on this trip and so half of them were hunting on do what? Boost? Well, I stack up. We'll that here in about two seconds. So the very first night, first of all, we were exhausted. Um, the London path was crazy. Um, so we, our first night, we stayed at a very, very nice, I can't remember, it's like, uh, I'll forget it, but it's an Addo. And it was this luxury, like they had sushi and like a private chef at this. It was ridiculous. So they were treated us really well the first night. And we went through, I think it was like a dozen bottles of wine between the whole group. Why'd you, why'd you get so quiet when you said that part? I'm, I think it was more than that. <laughs> yeah. But that was just wine. I mean, we had a wonderful first night. Um, and then from there, we drove to the first, like, hunting area. And we did hunt that night. There was one person that went out that night. Yeah. Um, and so that was, yeah, it was day two. I yeah. mean, day two we went hunting. But um, the rest of us got to side everything else in the next day. Gotcha. Before we all went out for our first hunt. Yeah. So, yeah. So what what does the landscape look like? What is it like? What are you seeing when you're going or when you first start going around? Like, what's the first things you're like noticing? It's like all Texas. That's exactly how I felt. Yeah. It's Absolutely. well, there's not slope. Definitely where I was. It like I was in the eastern Cape of um, Tarkastad area. It was the closest city, and it to me looked like east not east Texas, uh, like west Texas, south Texas. You know the hills of West Texas, but yeah, the bushes of, the South, bush Texas. of South Texas. Yeah, yeah. Is that what you saw too, Jared? Yeah. So, like, I guess it it might have been the same where you were too, Megan. But I didn't know this until I got there. But like South Africa, in order to be like a hunting place, or you know, um, yeah, just an, a safari uh, outfitter, you have to have like high fence, and they, I mean way bigger than what we see here, right? As far, we got some big ranches in Texas, but it's huge. Yeah. You know, you're not, you're not, you may see the high fence when you enter the thing in the morning and then not again, but mm -hmm. you see high fences. So I'm used to that already. Uh, but you, you're driving down these roads and it looks just like the terrain here too in South Texas, West Texas, but you're driving and you're like, wait a minute, is that a we after bush? And they're like, no, mm -hmm. that's uh, such and such. And I'm like, well, yeah. I'm starting yeah, to think the we so. <laughs> 
yeah. there's lots of thorns just like South Texas. Like, yeah, yeah it's very similar. So like, what were the first some of the first animals y'all saw? It might have, might not have been like animals like to hunt, but like, what were the first oh, animals y'all saw? A mean ass ostrich. <laughs> that was the first animal I saw. A mean ass. ostrich? Yes, and they told us they were like, "Do not get out of the vehicle." Like this thing was pacing up and down the fence, and we had to go through this gate to get yeah. on the other piece of property. There was one that was hauling ass down from the mountain, and the other one was already there pacing the fence. And they were like, don't entertain them. Like, don't look them in the eye. You know, like, that's a little dramatic. Don't look it in the eye. <laughs> but it was, it was just like, I never realized how big, I, I go to the zoo, but when I was a kid, I hadn't yeah. seen an ostrich that close. And I didn't know they were mean either. Yeah, yeah. They'll um, get after you. Yeah. And I they're cousins to them emus, huh, Jared? Oh, oh my gosh. Too. <laughs> you South Texas emus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we saw, uh, the first thing we saw were Impala. And, but they were kind of all over the place. We saw blue wildebeest out there too. But funny story about the ostrich. There was one male ostrich where I was hunting too. We saw it multiple days until I decided I wanted to hunt it the last day and then he didn't show up. But <laughs> my guy, I was like, what do y'all do if those things come after you? And he's like, well, here's what you do. And to this day, I don't know if it's bullshit or if it's the truth. But oh, this is hilarious. When, uh, when the ostrich comes up to you, they're going to hiss at you. And he said, when they hiss at you, grab their neck and shove their neck down and then they can't go anywhere and then you find a tree and you lead the thing all the way to a tree and when you get close to it you hit it on the back of the head real hard and climb as fast as you can i'm like i don't really know if i believe this but i'm not going to test it like they'll punch the shark in the face no the whole thing. Thing. <laughs> i'm gonna tell you right now if the ostrich comes at me and i'm in fear for my life his life will no longer be amongst us <laughs> I'll tell you that right now. If they have a three hundred dollars, four hundred dollar ostrich, we'll just have to work with it. I don't yeah, know, but yeah. I'm not grabbing him by the head. No, sir. <laughs> those those things are pretty big, man. I don't even know if I could barely reach his neck. It would be probably that too is low. The silliest story. <laughs> I'm just picturing Jared trying to do this. <laughs> yeah, I try to grab an ostrich by the neck and put his head down. Lose an eye yeah. in the meantime. Oh, yeah, yeah. So Jerry, what was the first animal that you that you were going after on this hunt? And I mean, like I know, like the kind of you're going around, and you're just kind of seeing animals, and yeah. then you kind of go after yeah. them. What were you trying to? I guess out of all those animals, what was the one that you did not want to leave Africa without? Kudu, absolutely. I wanted the gray ghost, nice. beautiful animal, had to have it. Um, but the first one, so the, the place we went to, we were kind of driving around. We saw a group of giraffe, and if you've never seen giraffe in person, like to see them up close and see them run and all that kind of stuff, it's crazy. But we drove past giraffe and then kind of went and got on the ground and started to just, we knew they'd be going to water because we got there late morning ride. They'd be headed to water mid midday. And so we, we started going towards water to look for whatever. And I had, four, I had five actually on the list. So we're walking towards this big, kind of pond lake that they had in, in that place and um, no joke like a few hundred yards in we're just going it's the tracker the, the ph and then myself and uh all of a sudden we look up and pumba's just sitting there looking at us and the guy's mm -hmm. like come here he throws the sticks down i get on him he's like shoot whenever you're ready he's about to go bam i got pumba within the first like hour or two that, that we're there so there's well, warthogs on my list too. I really want one of those. They're, 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 they're very cool. cool. They're cool animals. Yeah. Yeah. So like you said, you're like with the trackers and stuff. And like, I know both of y'all had experience working oh, with them. Oh, they were what, so fun. What was it like being with those guys? Like, I mean, I they got to be the, the real deal and, and stuff being out there all the time. But like, how good can they hunt? What do you think, Megan? I'll they go could back. see. <clears throat> they could see. And I, the reason I say this is because when I was hunting, they they convinced me to hunt a mountain reed buck. And yeah. they were like, it's one of those ones, it's, they're they're small and they're on a mountainside, just yeah. like their name. And they could, they'd be like, oh, did you see that one? Or do you see that? There's, there's three on that hillside. And I'm just looking and I'm like, nothing's moving. <laughs> like, I don't know. And, and it would be like, oh, he's behind that boulder, but his face is exposed. And I'm like, it was absolutely amazing. And of course they're, they're looking down to the ground and they're looking up in the trees and they're seeing what's scraping here and what's been laying there. And what scat is this and everything else. I mean, it was, it was really cool. And half the time they'd be asking about my camera gear or, you know, whatever else we had carrying with us. And so 
you get to know them and you're riding in the back of the truck with them for days on end, basically. Yeah. Um, you know, sharing lunch with them. And yeah, I mean, it was fun. It was real fun. So it's very similar. I would say the, the warthog didn't go far. We found that one easy. The the one that afternoon, I got two animals the first day. The impala came out, came to some water. We were sitting in this blind next to the water and uh, shot that one. He kind of ran and uh, had to track him a little bit. And it, it was like, it goes from like hard, just dry and nothing that, you know, there's just kind of hoof prints everywhere, but then it goes to red sand too. And this, there was some red sand and like blood ain't showing up. E even if it does, it's doing an end and that whole deal. I do not know how this guy found this Impala as easy as he did because we, we went off in that direction, no track, no blood, no nothing. And he's able to figure it out and go find them pretty easy. Yeah. 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 So like, May, what was the, you know, a lot of people, I didn't know what a mountain reed buck was when you, when you shot I, it. And I mean, I know we got pictures of it. We'll put it in the podcast too for you to see it, but like kind of tell us like how that went down. Um, like being able to like hunt in, in the mountains in Africa. That's one of those ranches. So that was one of the ranches. We were only there for a day and it was, and I'm not, I'm, I don't remember how many hectares. Cause it's like hectares to acres. And I'm probably saying hectares wrong. It's probably spelled completely different, but it was thousands and thousands and thousands of acres. Yeah. And we drove for four, four and a half hours. And we saw some females up on the side. And I was like, oh, you know, what's that? Um, and they told me what it was. And then um, there was apparently, a, you know, a trophy male. And this was seven or eight hours into the, I mean, we had left super early. Yeah. Um, and we had, you know, they had cattle out there randomly. I mean, there's just all kinds of cool stuff that you, I have tons of photos and videos. Um, if you guys know that but we'll share them on, on there as well but it was like rudy says rudy's our, our guide he was yeah. awesome yeah um he used to get really excited and be like you he would say that and they'd be like oh what, what do you see what do you see what do you see and he said that's a trophy read book and i'm like the microscopic like you <laughs> and I, I was getting so frustrated because i had my rifle up and i'm looking through the scope and i'm scanning and i'm looking for movement and he's like no no it's not moving it's just you have to find there's just there's this bush and there's a rock. And so I find the rock and I see the back line of that reed buck. And yeah. it was still so hard because the first the first shot ricocheted off the rock in front of it. And the second shot he hit. But then I'm not used to hunting on mountainsides. And so when I watched it, like it tumbled a little bit. And I, yeah. I freaked me out. I was like, no, no, no. Like it made me feel so bad. And yeah. So, I mean, it, it didn't go for very far. But I mean, then you have your um, trackers who are just like already on their way over to you know, retrieve it. It was yeah. insane. And it was in the middle of it's not a gorge it wasn't like a huge river but it was a, a water path through these two and we were hunting from one side to the other um onto the other other um hillside mountain face i mean it was pretty steep i don't know i'm not used to talking about elevated things i'm yeah. from freaking texas yeah. the flattest area um on the gulf coast but no it was really cool it was just so different because you're here you're used to seeing forever yeah and like there it's, it's i don't know it was so hard to find them on that that hillside yeah so like when like y'all were talking about like going through the brush and like doing all these different things and hunting this different way, was there any like any gear consideration that y'all took with y'all or did y'all like buy for this trip? I mean, besides your rifle, of course. My photo, my photo backpack was, I mean, that's it. Yeah. My camera backpack. Yeah. So like pretty much the same clothes you wear here, you wore over there too. Yeah. So that was probably pre-year jared you know before i decided to go to the mountains or anything over here and so i literally took like game guard camo and you know blue mm -hmm. jeans whatever right and so yeah. as far as clothing no i knew it would be kind of similar to our winter you know here and so i packed the appropriate jackets and stuff but the, the yeah one, the it one thing nice. i took that uh turned out great but could have been a disaster was i bought the first pair of Justin snake boots that, that I, well, I still wear them now, but uh, they were brand spanking new and I took them over there, didn't even think twice about it. And I walked 30 miles that week in those snake boots. And when I brought them back, they were good to go. But good looking, those in. Yeah, looking back, it was probably a terrible decision because it could have gone very wrong for me. Yeah, your feet could have been messed up for sure. But hey, now you know. I mean, like, there's not much else that, like you can do to your feet now mm -hmm. besides right. walking 30 miles in just in snake boots. We didn't walk nearly as much as I know for a fact we didn't walk nearly as much as you did, Jared, because we were riding around most of the time. Yeah. We rode around most of the time. 
um, in the Toyota Cruiser, I think is what it is. It's like Land a Cruiser? yeah, Land Cruiser. Yeah. The was decked out like like all we would be on the, the hillside, the mountainside, yeah. sideways, and we're just like trusting him that we're not going to fall off the face <laughs> of the side of this thing. And it was just it was amazing to see how equipped their the Land Cruisers were, and I mean the snorkel and everything. So yeah, yeah, yeah. just in case you had to go over water. And I hadn't, I hadn't brought a jacket. Jared mentioned packing a jacket, and I, I brought jackets, like travel sweatshirts and things like that. But I did not bring a outdoor, semi windproof, yeah. warm <laughs> jacket. Um, and I don't remember if it's, and I, I knew it would be chilly, but I did not understand. It's winter. Yeah. Like there could be a cold front. And, yeah. And there was, and it was very cold. And riding in the top of that uh, Land Cruiser all the time. I mean, it's. I had a buff at one point, gloves. Like, they had to let me borrow a couple different things because I was not prepared yeah, for that. Yeah, Megan does I was not, not like being cold. Well, extra jackets. I didn't know I'd be riding in the back of a, you know, exposed vehicle <laughs> for the entire time. That's my bad. <laughs> That's funny. It won't happen again. <laughs> right? You'll be hey, well but, equipped next time. Yeah, and RPH actually had jackets for us. Yeah, so. yeah. That, that jacket is pretty nice. I like it. Yeah, it's a I'll, down jacket. Yeah, that'll work. So, so you got you got two at oh go ahead we had uh the only truck i actually saw we, we weren't on that kind of trip megan well all we had was the ford uh ford ranger that was decked out so <laughs> the ford ranger. Ford ranger. <laughs> it was nice brand new diesel ford ranger and had all the stuff like the seating in the back um but yeah, yeah that's, that's where we were at and i you know i had a, a lighter jacket think about like when you go deer hunting here in texas and you put on a lighter jacket and you get yeah. out there, and you're like, man, I wish I had just a little bit bigger jacket. That's how it was. It wasn't too bad. But by yeah. mid-morning, you were down to short sleeves and half-ass sweating. It was, you know, yeah. kind of cold. Same thing off. is here. Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Same thing is here. Mm-hmm. So, Jared, what was, the, what was the next animal you went after? You got two in one day, so you kind of yeah. chill the next day, or you still hitting it pretty hard? No, we hit it hard every single day. Um, I trying to remember i think the second day i didn't get anything the third day um when it was cold we saw some spring buck that one over there um and got him pretty early and then we kind of kept going and in about mid-morning we saw uh, a blue wildebeest bull you know that was good enough to kind of shoot and he was about 200 yards away we were just driving down one of the dirt roads and saw him kind of under a tree and it's kind of shooting, you know, off the truck at a downward angle towards him 200 yeah. yards away or so and shot him in the chest. He drops. This is a longer story. It's kind of about the track or two, but he drops, gets up and takes off. And so we stop the truck, give him a minute and we're, you know, going in there to see if he's done or what's going on. And um, the tracker kind of looks around. We see some blood. We kind of start to follow the blood. And uh, he said, well, He's going to be right up here. He's laying down. And I'm like, again, how do you know this stuff? Yeah. <laughs> and sure enough, mm-hmm. like we, we were walking slowly, but I guess we bump him and he gets up and takes off. And so we're, you know, you're looking down. And at one point we lose blood. Like it's been long enough. He lost blood. You look down and there's just hoof prints everywhere. And yeah. you're like, how in the world, like you can tell like, a wildebeest versus a kudu, you know, all that kind of stuff. But there's so many, it's hard to keep track of which one is yours and all that kind of stuff. And so um, we hit another road and we look out and he's just standing in the middle of the road about 200 yards away. And so I put another one in him and he takes off, doesn't even drop, just takes off again. And dude, this is a 300 wind mag. I shot this dude in the chest. I you know, I punched him. Yeah. put one into his side. And he's he's going, and we we don't have any blood at this point, and so this tracker is literally looking at grass that is laid over, and it's like, oh, he went this way. And I'm like, I don't, whatever, man. If you know where this thing is gone, sounds well, good. I'll, yeah. I'll follow you, and I'll shoot it as soon as I see it. I don't know what to tell you. Um, Did y'all have any dogs with you? No, nah, no dogs with us. We had a dog with us. Yeah. You didn't. Yeah. We, we had a bloodhound in front of us. We didn't need any real dogs. <laughs> so. <laughs> We're, we're kind of, we're going through the brush and we knew there was a road coming up, you know, apparently right in front of us, kind of parallel. Um, and he said, well, we'll see his tracks there. Well, we get to that road and we look off to the right and it's kind of going up a hill and you can see it for a mile or so down there. 
this dude is just trekking down this road. And so at that point, he's like, we got to catch up to him. Like, we, we, this is this is the play. We got to catch up to him. Let's go. And so we get off of the road. And my PH looks at me. And this is the best South African accent I have. But he goes, are you ready to run? And I'm like, yes, so, man. Like, <laughs> and so, like, we just start jogging down this road through the brush, like trying to catch up to this blue wildebeest that's at least three quarters of a mile down this thing. And we go, I, I, we had to at least go, I don't know, I don't even want to try to guess, but I'm huffing and puffing. Everybody's kind of, you know, tired at this point. We stop and we peek out and he's not there anymore. And the guy, the, the tracker's like, oh, he'll be laying down off the road somewhere again. You, you must know what this animal's done before. Yeah. And so we're walking down this road. I said, like, get ready. As soon as you see him, you're going to have to shoot him because he's going to get up and he'll be gone again. And so we're walking. And sure enough, he's just like laying maybe 20 feet off the road. And as soon as I see him, put one in his neck. This dude jumps up from that. And by the time like I shoot him, oh, shoot one really? in the neck as he's laying down. And right at that time, I just jack another shell in and he pops up and I shoot him again in the body cavity, like in the chest. And he yeah. was 50 yards and just piles over. Four and a half miles, four shells. That's how long it took. And that's like this tracker. If we didn't have that guy, we would have never found this animal. But come to find out, Keenan, you know, the, the guys we knew from um, Louisiana, that's where I met yeah. him over there. And his brother shot one, Abram shot one, seven times. And they had, no, not seven times. I think it was three or four times they shot him, but tracked him seven miles. So I had no idea these animals were that tough, but apparently. Yeah, mm -hmm. I didn't either. I mean, you see them every now and then in National Geographic, you know, when they're getting taken down by a pride of lions or something. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, I guess, I mean, if you really think about it, and think about those fight scenes with those lions. They're they're putting up a pretty good fight. Oh, yeah. So they got to be a pretty tough animal. But still, four shots and and that far running like that that doesn't even make sense. That makes my like axis story like not even <laughs> we're not even in the same realm right now. So. I missed an opportunity because I couldn't run. Remember the uh, Gimsbuck? Oh yeah, yeah. We came up on a herd of Gimsbuck and. He was like, same. Like, he, I don't even ask me. He was just like, come on. Like, yeah. You know? And by the time we got up to the top of the hill and we get the sticks down and he's got me in on a herd and they're beautiful. And I'm just like, I can't, I can't catch my breath. I literally could not catch my breath to take a steady shot because yeah. it was, and that was maybe the second day he'd hunted with me. He goes, okay. Like, he had to reassess the. <laughs> yeah. I was like, yeah, by the way, I'm an osmotic. <laughs> <laughs> you might want to know that. Yeah. Yeah. You got to be. It helps to be in shape for sure, and it always gives you a little extra because I mean, them animals are running and they they stay in shape. That's how yeah. they stay alive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I will. I'll tell you, like that was that animal was probably the biggest surprise to me. Like I was like, okay, cool, blue wildebeest, woohoo! Like it's not a cape yeah. buffalo or you know something like that. And I was uh, all excited about the kudu, which kudu was cool. We'll talk about that in a second. But like yeah. the, that experience and to see how tough that animal was and have to go that far and like j like just run through the brush and all that kind of stuff, like that yeah. was that was the most exciting hunt I had over there. Yeah, yeah, that, that's what you want to do in Africa. Like you want to go hunt. Yeah. You want to go have to sweat a little bit, do a little work. I mean, like hunting in Africa has been. I mean, you come back ruined. Yeah. Like you come back <laughs> never wanting to sit in a blind ever again. <laughs> like that's how you feel when you first get. Oh, that's how I felt. Yeah. You want to do the safari style, spot mm, and stop. Yep. Spot and stop, get the sticks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a lot of fun for sure. So I know you got your, your mountain read book, mm -hmm. Megan. And, that was near the end of the trip, yeah. Yeah, so, but before that, because oh, you, yeah. you, from what Surprise. I remember, you you were carrying your camera more than the rifle at mm -hmm. this point. And then the animal that takes up a lot of space in, in our living room right now uh, gave you an opportunity. And, yeah. and which animal was that? That was the sable. Yeah. Yeah. And um, he's, he is very majestic. He is. He is. We saw a herd of them. Um, and he had asked because Debbie had a sable too, yeah. my friend Debbie. And she took her sable, and I just thought, oh, my God. They, the way they stand, I mean, everything there. 
every animal, I mean, I don't, it doesn't matter which one you're looking at, they're all going to stand as if they deserve to be on the ground that they're standing on. Like yeah. they, like, especially with the sable, like they just always had this look about them that was so majestic. And they're like, well, you know, there's another one that, you know, he has available. We just have to go to this different piece of property. And so I'm thinking about it, thinking about it. And um, we looked for him. And then I think we had a window about, I don't, I don't want to make it like dramatic, but it was a pretty small window. Um, I had followed Rudy around and I didn't lose my breath this time. He took his time. <laughs> yeah. We stuck up a little bit closer and closer. And then I realized how massive this thing was. And I'm just really glad that I didn't have my 270 and that I was using somebody else's gun at that point. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he took two shots to get him down too. And it was, it was really exhilarating. Like, especially putting your hands on him. Now, the one thing that was kind of weird, I didn't have a video of this is he didn't go like he was out of it, but he was kicking and he was, so, they're like a horse. I mean, yeah. they're enormous animals and the trackers are sitting there trying to like hold his head down and keep him from kicking everybody else yeah. while we we're standing around him. And so I didn't like, I mean, that's hard for me because it's, yeah. it's hard in, in my pH. It's like you, you did two good shots. Like he's fine. It's just the nerves, it's just the nerves. And, so that was different. It was the biggest animal I've ever killed yeah. by far. So kind of like a like the rattlesnake deal. Like you kind of you kill a rattlesnake mm -hmm. and it's, it's still moving. I mean, it happens with different animals too, man. I've had like deer that we were dragging out of the back of the like ranger or something and it still like throws you a little leg or something like that. So yep. yeah, that, that happens quite a bit. Yeah. But yeah. But yes, it was very cool. And I still like, think it took me a few weeks to even be like, oh my gosh, you have a sable. Like, yeah. you know, and uh, like I said, I didn't have a plan. And so once I realized that not many people have, you know, killed these animals yeah. or like, you know, I was very curious. I'm like, okay, well, where does that meat go and everything else? And so we met the ranch manager, we met the owner and everything else. And we were processing on site. Um, like I said, large animals. So I was curious. I'm like, well, I can't take all the meat back with me. Yeah. Um, so my biggest thing was it was different for me because I was used to cleaning, skinning, you know, putting everything in a cooler, taking it home, processing it. Um, and this was, this was different. So I had a lot of questions. Yeah. I did. I asked the pH a lot of questions about where is it going and everything else. And it, it benefits the community and the local economy. Yep. Um, and the landowner actually makes the decisions um, based on where he would like to benefit the most. So yeah. it was out of my hands completely, which was really different. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. I mean, it's cool that your pH even took the time to explain it to you. No, he's great. Yeah. yeah. Rudy's a pretty Rudolph cool Stefan is, is great. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's really trying great. to get me to come kill a Cape Buffalo, but. You know, way my bank account. Works. Oh yeah, he goes. Where's y'all's honeymoon gonna be? Yeah, we gotta work on that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go with you. I, I need to say. <laughs> yeah, there you go. We, hey, man, you know, we can get Rudy to cut us a deal. We do a two for one special, maybe <laughs> something. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, we'll, we'll get it worked out. So your kudu, Jared, which is hanging in your house, which is a pretty huge oh, kudu, beautiful, huge kudu. Well, back up. Hold on one second. Your sable was pretty big too i know jared did you enter your stuff in in oh, SCI, sci or anything like that uh -uh. yeah but you entered your your sable and he was he, he's he, in the record book but he didn't run the awards or anything yeah yeah, yeah. well that's pretty cool too so your kudu tell me that story so the first day two animals down skip a day third day two animals down uh i think we we didn't we rode around, didn't see one one day, and then the next day, I mean, we would see some, but literally when they talk about gray ghosts, that the thing is a ghost because like you'll see it, and as soon as you see yes. it, it's gone. Like it, it is not standing around. Yeah, and um, but the ones we did see, are, we're able to kind of glass and look at. They, you know, they weren't mature enough. So they, what we were looking for was they look for three curls, and then to have ivory tips on it and that's okay. considered a mature bull and so we saw you know a few of them here and there and, and we would kind of ride around see them at the back of the truck and then we would get out and just they would have sections and we would just start walking and clear that section and just kind of go you know in and out of there if we saw one going to the brush we would kind of get out and make a plan and kind of put a stalk on them. but yeah it was uh i i will tell you this awesome kudu i'm glad it's on the wall it was less romantic of a hunt than what the blue wildebeest turned out to be. So, you know, we saw these immature ones hunting and, and that day that I got it, 
it was lunchtime and we just pulled over to this, you know, camp house that they had on the place. And we just, you know, they would pack lunches and send them with you. So we're just hanging out, eating, eating lunch. And, uh, one of the other guides that was hunting on the same place and said, Hey, y'all are looking for a kudu. I see a good one over here. Y'all need to come over here. And so we just throw the food in the truck and get in and we take off and we finally get over to the other pH and he's like, Hey, he's, you know, I saw him over here. You know, he went into the brush. Don't know where he's at now, but you know, go get him. Yeah. We drive around there and it's kind of obviously midday around lunch and this dude's just hanging out right underneath the tree. And it was probably 150 yard shot. It wasn't far at all, but I, you know, good shot. He went 50 yards and just piled up and that was it. And so I remember when we went over to it, it's an awesome animal to put your hands on and do everything and, and look yeah. at, but we're taking pictures and the pH is like, aren't you excited? This is awesome. I was like, yeah, I'm totally excited. I didn't have that expression on my face and I, I don't, I didn't know it at the time, but it was probably like, man, that was a lot less, you know, exciting and romantic than what happened a couple days ago. But yes, yeah, yeah. Awesome. the one year, the one you were like counting on to be like the climactic hunt wasn't yeah. the one, the no. one that you really worried about is the one that made you the most excited that was the easiest one out of the whole the whole thing so yeah yeah so like with y'all since y'all been now like what's what's changed like is there animals that you didn't think about before that are now on the list like i want to go with my bow that's really what's changed yeah, yeah. that's what i want to do now yeah that would be fun i wouldn't shit I, I'm, I'm with megan if, if i went back I wouldn't even take a rifle. I would take my yeah. bow. Yeah. It wouldn't be animals that I got already. It would be something different. But K buffalo, like you, I mean, that's high on the list. Oh, God. You yeah. guys in these K buffalo. Dude, I, I would have been K <laughs> buffalo with a bow. Black a death. Bow. Black death, baby. My top three hunts I want to go on, man. Y'all can go on that one together. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Well, we can do I'll, it. I'll keep the long lens in the truck. <laughs> I'll no, I need, land you, I need you right behind me, right over my shoulder to get that, that good shot. <laughs> I've been, ch I've been chasing you down. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We'll make sure we get you be able to oh run that God. one just in case. Just in case. No, I mean, so y'all share the want or desire for like, what's the big five, right? Yeah. yeah. I don't I'm good. Yeah. I'm like good. a lot of people probably wouldn't hunt an elephant, but I would. No, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm just not as like, you know, yeah. Africa big five. Like I'm not super like, that's not all my, my goal. Now turkey slam here. Yes. But like, yeah. that's the only thing I can really compare it to is like a certain goal to meet. Right. Makes sure. sense. So I'm just not, I'm not good. Yeah. So you're more like playing the game I, stuff. The adrenaline. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm good with playing the game. <laughs> the less dangerous ones. Maybe a, well, I feel like they're dangerous too, but yeah. They yeah. said it's like a unique way of hunting those. I don't know. I, I might be watch five years down the road, be like, yeah, the lot, what the lot, hell was it, I thinking? Yeah, it always changes. You you think one one way for a little bit, and then opportunities come, yeah. and you learn new things. And, and there's it just changes. so much I, I have left here. I think maybe once I get a few more animals under my belt from the continental U.S. and broaden my horizons a little bit more, yeah, I want to travel there. Yeah, definitely. I probably spend more time there. I don't know about you, Jared. It was a pretty long trip, but I still feel like I could have just the beginning and end like the four days on the front and the back were longer than like the travel days were longer yeah it was yeah. good so, it was yeah, a good for me I, I wish i was there longer um but like the elephant stuff and all that like i got i don't know it would have to be the right circumstance right like i you know mm -hmm. it, it's heavily scrutinized yeah. right and so for me yeah. it would have to be in one of those communities to where they have these tags and it's a it's a mature or aging bull or something like that that yep. you know exactly you're trying to get out of the herd and once you do like all the locals come up and they start butchering the thing up and take it home you know like that's yeah, that's yeah. exactly exactly like, i mean it's more than just a trophy yeah, yeah definitely for sure because i mean like you said in africa you don't get to bring any of the meat back but it does benefit the community mm -hmm. that it's that it's in and all so. the dollars that you spent in there you know that's what i'm saying everything's positive for them and I'd love to dig deeper into that. I think that's something else I'd like to do is learn more about that and like how I, what my trip does and what that, you know, how that supports the local area. Yeah. I mean, I actually looked up some stuff, so I got some facts, but we, we could definitely dive a little deeper into that. But I did look up the fact that, um, so in South Africa, 90%, which is the South Africa is like the crown the biggest jewel country for, hunt for like well, hunting. Not, 
not crown jewel. I mean, you don't think so? Depending on the animal you're going after. Okay, yeah. Depending on the animal you're going after. Exactly. And yeah. you have notes on that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so depending on the animal you're going after, but like, uh, so yeah, South Africa has 90% of all the hunting that goes on in Africa happens yeah. there. So it's like the mo- probably the, the busiest one. And then like we were referring to the big five earlier, if you don't know, big five is a hippo, crocodile, a lion, a leopard, and a cape buffalo. So those those are the big five animals, and I want to hunt every single one of them. <laughs> uh, so there's a couple different countries you can uh, hunt in Africa because when when people say Africa, it's a continent. There's multiple countries within that continent, mm-hmm. which South Africa being one. There's Mozambique, Zimbabwe, Tanzania, uh, Namibia, um, which is like coming up to be like one of the newer places I guess people are, are hunting. Um, for different animals and stuff. They have like a lot of gims buck and spring buck species there. So there's about 1.4 million square kilometers of land that is conserved for hunting in Africa, which is quite a bit. I mean, and that's across the whole continent, not just like South Africa. Uh, they're actually hunting supports 86,000 jobs in Africa. Yeah. So that's a huge, huge, huge industry for them. Like for, cause I mean, they're in a, third world country so they don't really have many options for what well, brings jobs. funding for con- i mean that's the thing these are not cheap hunts that's what jared and i are talking about like the opportunities we've had have been on different circumstances than you going out and trying to buy a trip out there you know yeah. so the every i, I don't want to say every dollar but and you've seen a lot of the economy you see how many jobs it's given how much food it's given to the area it's just it's fantastic yeah and i mean not not just that economy but just for the people but also for the animals because, I mean, mm-hmm. the people that are doing the anti-poaching stuff are the hunters, are the PHs, are the the trackers and everybody. Like, those people, the tribes and stuff that are there, they're the ones that get hired to run anti-poaching. Mm-hmm. And once they're given a, a reason to to join that effort, it's, it's less people that are poaching, essentially, also. So, I mean, there, there's a lot of great benefits to people traveling to hunt in, in Africa and stuff. So, I mean, there's... So talk about anti-poaching. Here's a quick story that happened to us over there. You had like on some of those places, these guys are on foot, man. And I don't think people realize that. Like oh, yeah. literally they look like someone in the army and they're like, they're camoed out yeah. and everything, have ARs or, or something. And like, they just walk into the bush. Like that's what these guys are doing. And, mm-hmm. you know, we would take them food. Like I, I didn't, but like they would take them food and drop it off and do all that kind of stuff. But, we were on this place and we were walking one day and then we came up on, you know, a group of, you know, anti uh, poaching agents or whatever, whatever they're called. Yeah. But um, they asked us to lift, lift our shoes up and they looked at the bottom of our shoes and they were like, Oh, y'all were over here yesterday. Uh, tracking oh this or that or whatever. And I'm just like, again, I'm like, how do you know this stuff? <laughs> There's nowhere to yeah, hide. So he knew, like, by looking at the imprint that y'all, the print that y'all left in y'all shoes, where y'all were, just yep. by looking at it. A day yeah. ago, like, not this afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. Well, I mean, I guess if you think about it, there's probably not many human footprints besides their own mm-hmm. hunters and then people that ain't supposed to be there. Yeah, but they know <laughs> who's supposed to be there. They knew they're like, okay, this is the American's foot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? We That's had one funny. guy, and I think the only experience I had with an anti-poaching um, just organization was the last place we stayed because we were staying in like family homes for a while. Yeah. Um, but at the game reserve we stayed at, or the very end where we were like all pampered and photography and everything yeah, else, yeah. Um, if we walked up and it's like GI Joe met met us yep. basically at camp. He, he was and like you said, just completely decked out, um, and we were like, well, we feel very safe, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, but. I didn't, I kind of, but at the same time, I was like, this is intense, you know, like I didn't realize it's such a big, and I mean, you you see the stories about people who have been caught getting, because they were eaten by lions when they are trying to, you know, poach a piece of property. They don't know what's in that segment and they Mm -hmm. jump in and then that's bad news. But I mean, that it's sad because a lot of it is, it's illegal and it's horrible and it's hurting the, the, the um, animal populations. But at the same time, it's like, these people are desperate. So It's yeah. a big problem. That's a very big problem. Yeah, because I mean, those those, as much as we don't like poachers, we don't like what they're doing. But in that instance, in Africa, all they're doing is trying to 
get those guys that are doing the actual poaching, not the people that are sending them there. Yeah. All, all they're trying to do is feed their family. And mm -hmm. that's the opportunity that they have to feed their family is to go out and poach these animals. And like you said, like when people can bring in like those 86,000 jobs and stuff working for the ranches rather than working poaching, it, it really helps with that. You would that think. Poaching yeah. effort. effort. You would think. But, and yeah. I'm not going to pretend like I know everything. This is all from my perspective of from yeah. my trip. You know, yeah. like there's, like I said, if I go back, I'd love to learn more. Yeah, exactly. And that that's what we like doing. And it'll, I wanted to say too, like I saw that the like the amount of money that's generated every year is close to half a billion dollars. So around four hundred twenty six million dollars every year is generated from hunters going to Africa. That's from here. That's from Europe. That's from Asia. Anybody from Australia, New Zealand, but by far, of course, America, we, we send the most hunters over there. And I think that number's around like 20,000 plus a year. Wow. Yeah. You yeah, could I'm definitely right. tell on the airplane, like I forgot to tell you this, on the way there, uh, when we got on the plane in Atlanta, headed to Johannesburg, um, you get back to the, the coach seats or whatever, and you look around, you can pick out a hunting guy. It was going, yeah. He's yeah. not wearing camo, but you can, you can tell. But, yeah. Uh, you look around and you're like, all these dudes are going to Africa. Like, there's more of us yeah. on this plane than anybody else. Dude, yeah, it's kind of like going to Vegas during the NFL. It's the summertime. <laughs> yeah. It is because everybody here, it's like you're either fishing or you're going to Africa. I mean, yeah. it's like the two major things mm -hmm. or axis hunting here. Yeah, that's you. So, that's you. Megan, Megan, I got a question for you. What was the most surprising or strangest thing you ate over there? My memory really sucks. Let me try to think. <laughs> Besides wine. Oh, the <laughs> wine was fantastic. I didn't know South Africa had such great wine. It really does. Y'all need to try it. Um, what did I eat that was weird? I know I had something with a bug in it. But I can't remember if it was like a shot or if it was like a uh, food. I don't think it I think it was just in like a, a shot. What did we have? Nothing was really that weird. I mean, yeah. we were kind of spoiled, Jared. Like, why? Did you eat something really weird? Oh, we had, uh, you know, we ate, like, kudu steaks and, like, blue wildebeest is almost like their hamburger. Oh, we had some very interesting protein, like, yeah. The most surprising thing, they didn't actually tell us this until everybody ate it, but. Uh, oh, of great. Course, of course. Yeah. Zebra was surprisingly good. Like, it had, it wasn't a spice, but it was a different kind of flavor. I've heard that all and, the time. Like, I would eat it. It was delicious. It, I, honestly, it was as good or maybe a little better than a kudu steak was. Then cutie steak. Yeah, I've heard that from mm -hmm. multiple people saying that zebra tastes pretty freaking good. Yeah. I don't think besides like some of the sides being cold when I thought they were going to be like hot, <laughs> like I don't know. There, you had to remember half this group doesn't hunt or like didn't have any interest in. Yeah, like, so they kind of had weird like, things. Yeah. Like so we we had very good food. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't. I don't think it was anything really like Strangers, they would have. If they'd have done that to us, I think we would have had a problem. <laughs> Honestly, like I think at least one person would have been like, "You did what?" Like, <laughs> I don't think That's that would have worked for us. <laughs> so, like, uh, one thing too is like getting getting animals back. What, oh what was that process like? Because a lot of people say it's 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 not worth the effort because of this. But I think if you if you set it up right and you kind of like go into it, or at least have somebody kind of walk you through it that's done it before, I think it could be a pretty simple process. Yep. So yeah. I would say like I chose to have the taxidermy done over there and the, the safari outfitter, he, he did the taxidermy. He, you know, did the meat deal like Megan's talking about. Like he, he did a lot of things associated with that, that piece hunting yeah. uh, and it was cheaper to get them done over there. And so since I had so many, I decided to do that and I, I'm happy with the work. There's a couple of things that you kind of pick out once they get here. Um, yeah, it's not it's not B and B taxidermy and Cairo, you know, but uh, yeah, 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 it's it's good, it's good work. Um, but COVID hit, and so mm -hmm. <laughs> it shut mm -hmm. down. Like it was going to take at least a year or so for it to happen anyway. And, yeah. Uh, so you have to have this broker over here that yep. sets up the, I guess, the customs paperwork, the transportation. You can choose to ship it over in a freight container, which takes longer, but it's cheaper. But by the time, like a, a plane flight seems cheaper and that's the route I was going to go. But after talking to the person over here, the customs person that did all the paperwork, he's like, look, 
it's going to sit in a warehouse in Africa for a minute and you're going to have a charge for that. Then it's going to get on the boat and you know that charge. But by the time it gets over here, it may get stuck at customs to sit in a warehouse and gain some, you know, charges there. He said, you're better off just shipping it on the plane and getting it over here and being done with it. And that's what I did. But it, it's, it still took way over a year and I had to stay on it like, hey, what's going on now? What's this? Do I need to pay this? And just boom, boom, boom. But um, I, I had the guy's information. He's down around Houston, a very professional, been doing it for like 30 years. And so yeah. kind of knows how to work the system and do it. But COVID definitely threw a, a wrench in it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think we decided that my, like it was just a split hair between your trip and my, or my trip and your trip where like mine barely made it back. But yeah. I also had them, um, I only had them preserve, like I got the, um, hides tanned and everything cleaned and broken down in South Africa, but then we had it built here at B and B with yeah. Frank Baird. Yeah. So they built it out. So mine was completely opposite of yours. I had you had yours completely done, then shipped. Mine were sh so mine were here before that issue started. Yeah. But it's still. I mean, I was very thankful again for my friends because <laughs> yeah. a lot of it was here's who you're going to use. It was a splitting image uh, taxidermy in uh, South Africa, and they're amazing, yeah. amazing. Um, uh, then we got it here. We picked him up in December or something of the next year. It was, it was still a long time, but it's taxidermy. Yeah. So it was a little bit easier for me because they could call me and I'm right down the road in Houston. Yep. I, I liked it that way. Um, not that I wouldn't trust splitting image. I mean, I went and toured their shop. I saw all their work. They had, oh my gosh, that was one of the coolest parts of the trip. It was like we were, we were getting ready to leave. We were halfway to the airport. We dropped everything off and like talked to them and did all our paperwork and yeah. everything. And it was, you know, you name it. It was a huge warehouse and just they're, they're working on stuff. There's Buffalo. There's, I mean, there's like 16 different styles of sable I could choose from just like, <laughs> just from looking in their showroom of like, not even the showroom, just the, the, the warehouse. Like yeah. You could walk through the entire thing. And so I had to decide, you know, which way do I want him to face? And which, and of course it's so funny now because like Brandon said, he's got his horns that are like half an inch from the ceiling and his eyes are right here. <laughs> um, but it's, you know, He'll be we'll getting a bigger house one day, but it was really cool. It was yeah. a great experience. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of work that goes into like having the brokerage here. Um, they ask you like six or seven times if they don't have your uh, passport. There's something about the actual PH had to sign off on the animal harvest, and like there's there's a ton of stuff they yeah. have to account for, which is great. I'm glad that they have those regulations. Yeah, but at least y'all had like good people to kind of walk y'all through it. And yeah, get y'all through the process. I would and I'll put you in their direction if you have any questions because I probably won't help you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to know more about the process. Yeah. So. So like here, when you hunt, like it's either on a weekend you're free or you know you schedule a hunt trip. Like we went to Idaho for a week. You, you have those right, yeah. but you're still in America. I will say it's pretty cool. Like you go that far out of the country, and it. I was calling Jenna, at, you know, almost midnight, and she it's twelve hour difference, right? So she's waking up, going to work, and I'm going to bed vice versa yeah but hunting all day like that and like walking six or seven miles a day you know that part's awesome then you get back to camp and you have a big roaring fire waiting on you with a cold beer that's not you know anything we have over here but uh it's, <laughs> it's good anyway after a day like that and it's just it's a good time if you get a chance i would definitely recommend doing it I'm, i'll do it one day if if not sooner than uh, whenever River turns 18 and graduates. Mm -hmm. schedule. Yeah, well, yeah, the hospitality is, it, you know, it's unmet, honestly. I have never had as good a hospitality as I did on that trip. Yeah. And, like, I know why, just because she's been and she was not going to let us go and have any other experience. Yeah. But, you know, Monica described it to me, and it always sounded like, oh, you know, that'd be cool. It's a trip I will go on again. Definitely. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm glad we got to talk about Africa. Um, I guess if you have anybody listening that has any questions, maybe you can ask Jared, not Megan. No. Or if, ask Megan, but she'll point you in the right direction. I'll get direction. better. Yeah. I'll get better, I promise. <laughs> point you in the right direction if somebody can't answer them. But yeah, man, so uh, good podcast, great conversation as always, guys. Uh, we appreciate y'all listening. Uh, follow us on Instagram. Hit subscribe on that YouTube channel. Um, Spotify, too. Uh, leave us a review if you like the podcast. Share it with a friend. You know, a lot of people like hunting and fishing, so let them hear the podcast, too. Don't be greedy with it. Share it with everybody. All right, guys. See y'all next week. Bye, y'all.